Chapter 18, Renewing the Sectional Struggle, 1848 to 1854. Secession? Peaceable secession? Sir, your eyes and mine are never destined to see that miracle. The year 1848, highlighted by a rash of revolutions in Europe, was filled with unrest in America. The Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo had officially ended the war with Mexico, but it had initiated a new and perilous round of political warfare in the United States. The vanquished Mexicans had been forced to relinquish an enormous tract of real estate, including Texas, California, and all the area in between. The acquisition of this huge domain raised anew the burning issue of extended slavery into the territories. Northern anti-slavery rights had rallied behind the Wilmot Proviso, which flatly prohibited slavery in any territory acquired in the Mexican War. Southern senators had blocked the passage of the Proviso, but the issue would not die. Ominously, debate over slavery in the area of the Mexican session threatened to disrupt the ranks of both Whigs and Democrats and split national parties along north-south sectional lines. The popular sovereignty panacea. Popular sovereignty is something you should be aware of, the concept of popular sovereignty. Each of the two great political parties was a vital bond of national unity, for each enjoyed powerful support in both North and South. If they should be replaced by two purely sectional groupings, the Union would be in peril. To politicians, the wisest strategy seemed to be to sit on the lid of the slavery issue and ignore the boiling beneath. Even so, the cover bobbed up and down ominously in response to the agitation of zealous Northern abolitionists and impassioned Southern fire-eaters. Anxious Democrats were forced to seek a new standard-bearer in 1848. President Polk, broken in health by overwork and chronic diarrhea, had pledged himself to a single term. The Democrat National Convention at Baltimore turned to an aging leader, General Lewis Cass, a veteran of the War of 1812. Although a senator and diplomat of wide experience and considerable ability, he was sour-visaged and somewhat pompous. His enemies dubbed him General Gass and quickly noted that Cass rhymed with jackass. The Democratic platform, in line with the lid-sitting strategy, was silent on the burning issue of slavery in the territories. But Cass himself had never been silent. His views on the extension of slavery were well known because he was the reputed father of popular sovereignty. This was the doctrine that stated that the sovereign people of a territory, under the general principles of the Constitution, should themselves determine the status of slavery. Popular sovereignty had a persuasive appeal. The public liked it because it accorded with the democratic tradition of self-determination. Politicians liked it because it seemed a comfortable compromise between the abolitionist bid for a ban on slavery in the territories and Southern demands that Congress protect slavery in the territories. Popular sovereignty tossed the slavery problem into the laps of the people in the various territories. Advocates of the principle thus hoped to dissolve the most stubborn national issue of the day into a series of local issues. Yet popular sovereignty had one fatal defect it might serve to spread the blight of slavery. Popular Triumphs for General Taylor The Whigs, meeting in Philadelphia, cashed in on the Taylor fever. They nominated frank and honest Zachary Taylor, the hero of Buena Vista, who had never held civil office or even voted for president. Henry Clay, the living embodiment of Whiggism, should logically have been nominated, but Clay had, too many, had made too many speeches and too many enemies. So the Taylor Whigs nominate Zachary Taylor, 1848. As usual, the Whigs pussyfooted in their platform. Eager to win at any cost, they dodged all troublesome issues and merely extolled the homespun virtues of their candidate. The self-reliant old frontier fighter had not committed himself on the issue of slavery extension, but as a wealthy resident of Louisiana, living on a sugar plantation, he owned scores of slaves. Ardent anti-slavery men in the North, distrusting both Cass and Taylor, organized the Free Soil Party. Aroused by the conspiracy of silence in the Democratic and Whig platforms, the Free Soilers made no bones about their own stand. They came out four square for the Wilmot Proviso and slavery in the and against slavery in the territories. Going beyond other anti-slavery groups, they broadened their appeal by advocating federal aid for internal improvements and by urging free government homesteads for settlers. The new party assembled a strange assortment of new fellows in the same political bed. It attracted, one, industrialists miffed at Polk's reduction of protective tariffs. tariffs. It appealed to Democrats resentful of Polk's settling on part of Oregon while insisting on all of Texas, a disparity that suggested a menacing Southern dominance in the Democratic Party. It harbored many Northerners who hated, whose hatred was directed not so much at slavery as at blacks and uh, at, who gagged at the prospect of sharing the newly acquired Western territories with African Americans. 
It also contained a large element of conscious Whigs, heavily influenced by the abolitionist crusade, who condemned slavery on moral grounds. The free soilers trotted out wizened former President Van Buren and marched into the fray, shouting, Free soil, free speech, free labor, and free men. The freedoms provided the bedrock on which the free soilers built their party. Free soilers condemned slavery not so much for enslaving blacks, but for destroying the chances of free white workers to rise up from wage-earning dependence to the esteemed status of its self-employment. Free soilers argued that only with free soil in the West could a traditional American commitment to upward mobility continue to flourish. If forced to compete with slave labor, more costly wage labor would inevitably wither away, and with it the chance for the American worker to own property. At the first as the first widely inclusive party organized around the issue of slavery and confined to a single section, the Free Soil Party forced out of the emergence of the Republican Party six years later. This is going to be Lincoln's party. With the slavery issue officially shoved under the rug by the two major parties, the politicians on both sides opened fire on personalities. The amateurish Taylor had to be carefully watched, lest his indiscreet pen puncture his reputation won by the sword. His admirers puffed him up as a gallant knight and a Napoleon, and slogan his remark, sloganized his remark, allegedly uttered during the Battle of Vena Vista, Taylor's wartime popularity pulled him through. He harvested 1,360,967 popular and 163 electoral votes, as compared with Cass's 1,222,342 popular and 127 electoral votes. Free Soiler Brent Van Buren, although winning no state, polled 291,263 ballots and apparently diverted enough Democratic strength from Cass in the crucial state of New York to throw the election to Taylor. California Gold Tobacco-chewing President Taylor, with his stumpy legs, rough features, heavy jaw and black hair, ruddy complexion and squinty gray eyes, was a military square peg in a political round hole. He would have been, he'd been spared much turmoil if he could have continued to sit on the slavery lid, but the discovery of gold in California early in 1848 blew the cover off. The horde of adventurers, adventurers poured into the valleys of California, singing, Oh, Susanna! They began frantically tearing down at the yellow graveled streams and hills. A fortunate few of the bearded miners struck it rich at diggings, but the luckless many who net netted blisters instead of nuggets probably would have been well ahead if they had stayed at home unaffected by the gold fever, which was fo often followed by more deadly fevers. The most reliable profits were made by those who mined the miners, notably the charging outrageous rates for laundry and other personal services. Some soiled clothing was even sent as far away as the Hawaiian Islands for washing. The overnight importing of tens of thousands of people into the Golden State completely overwhelmed the one-horse government of California. A distressingly high proportion of the newcomers were lawless men, accompanied or followed by virtueless women. A contemporary song ran, What was your name in the States? Was it Thompson or Johnson or Bates? Did you murder your wife and fly for your life? Say, what was your name in the States? An outburst of crime inevitably resulted from the presence of so many miscreants and outcasts. Robbery, claim jumping, and murder were commonplace, and such violence was only partly discouraged by rough vigilante justice. In San Francisco from 1848 to 1846, there were scores of lawless killings, but only three semi-legal hangings. A majority of Californians, as decent and law-abiding citizens needing protection, grappled earnestly with the problem of erecting an adequate state government. Privately encouraged by President Taylor, they drafted a constitution in 1849 that excluded slavery and then boldly applied to Congress for admission. California would thus bypass the usual territorial stat stage, thwarting Southern congressmen seeking to block free soil. Southern politicians, alarmed by the Californians' impertinent stroke for freedom, arose in violent opposition. Would California prove to be the golden straw that broke the back of the Union? Sectional balance and the Underground Railroad. The South of 1850 was relatively well off. It then enjoyed, as it had from the beginning, more than its share of the nation's leadership. It had seated in the White House the war hero Zachary Taylor, a Virginia-born, slave-owning planter from Louisiana. It boasted a majority in the cabinet and on the Supreme Court. If outnumbered in the House, the South had an equality in the Senate, where it could at least neutralize northern maneuvers. Its cotton fields were expanding, and cotton prices were profitably high. Few sane people, North or South, believed that slavery was seriously threatened where it had already existed below the Mason-Dixon line. The 15, states, the 15 slave states could easily veto any proposed constitutional amendment. 
Yet the South was deeply worried, as it had been for several decades, by the ever-tipping political balance. There were then 15 slave states and 15 free states. The admission of California would destroy the delicate equilibrium in the Senate, perhaps forever. Potential slave territory under the American flag was running short, if it had not in fact disappeared. Agitation had already developed in the territories of New Mexico and Utah for admission as non-slave states. The fate of California might well establish a precedent for the rest of the Mexican Cession Territory, an area purchased largely with southern blood. Texas nursed an additional grievance of its own. It claimed a huge area east of the Rio Grande and north to the 42nd parallel, embracing in part about half the territory of present-day New Mexico. I'm going to pause for a minute. You can look over on the next page. There's the image they're talking about. The federal government was proposing to detach this prize, while hot-blooded Texans were threatening to descend upon Santa Fe and seize what they regarded as rightfully theirs. The explosive quarrel foreshadowed shooting. Many Southerners were also angered by the nagging agitation in the North for abolition and of slavery in the District of Columbia, Washington, D.C. They looked with alarm on the prospect of a 10 square mile oasis of free soil thrust between slaveholding Maryland and slaveholding Virginia. Even more disagreeable to the South was the loss of runaway slaves, many of whom were assisted north by the Underground Railroad. This virtual freedom train consisted of an informal chain of stations, anti-slavery homes, through which scores of passengers or runaway slaves were spirited by conductors, usually white and black abolitionists, from the slave states to the free soil sanctuary of Canada. The most amazing of these conductors was an illiterate runaway slave from Maryland, fearless Harriet Tubman. During 19 forays into the South, she rescued more than 300 slaves, including her aged parents, and deservedly earned the title Moses. Lively imaginations later exaggerated the role of the Underground Railroad and its station masters, but its existence was a fact. By 1850, Southerners were demanding a new and more stringent fugitive slave law. The old one, passed by Congress in 1793, had proved inadequate to cope with runaways, especially since unfriendly state authorities failed to provide needed cooperation. Unlike cattle thieves, the abolitionists who ran the Underground Railroad did not gain personally from their lawlessness, but to the slave owners, the law was the loss was infuriating, whatever the motives. The moral judgments of the abolitionists seemed in some ways more galling than the outright theft. They reflected not only the holier-than-thou attitude, but a refusal to obey the laws solemnly passed by Congress. Estimates indicate that the South, in 1850, was losing perhaps a thousand runaways a year out of its total of some four million slaves. In fact, more blacks probably gained their freedom by self-purchase or voluntary emancipation than ever escaped, but the principle weighed heavily with the slave masters. They rested their argument on the Constitution, which protected slavery, and on the laws of the Congress, which provided for slave catching. Although the loss of property is still felt, the loss of honor is felt still more, said one Southern senator. The Twilight of Senatorial Giants Southern fears were such that Congress was confronted with a catastrophe in 1850. Free Soil California was banging on the door for submission, for admission, and fire eaters in the South were voicing ominous threats of secession. The crisis brought into con congressional form the most distinguished assemblage of statesmen since the Constitutional Convention of 1787. The old guard of the dying generation and the young gladiators of the new. That immoral, immortal trio, trio, Clay, Calhoun, and Webster, appeared together for the last time on the public stage. Henry Clay, now 73 years of age, played a crucial role. The great pacificator had come to the Senate from Kentucky to engineer his third great compromise. The once glamorous statesman, though disillusioned, enfeebled and racked by a cruel cough, was still eloquent, conciliatory, and captivating. He proposed and skillfully defended a series of compromises. He was ably seconded by 37-year-old Senator Stephen A. Douglas of Illinois, the little giant, 5 feet 4 inches whose role was less spectacular but even more important. Clay urged with all his persuasiveness that the North and the South both make concessions and that the North partially yield by exacting a more feasible fugitive slave law. Senator John C. Calhoun, the great nullifier, then 68 and dying of tuberculosis, championed the South as his, in his last formal speech. Too weak to deliver it himself, he sat bundled up in the Senate chamber, his eyes glowing within a stern face, while a younger colleague read his fateful words. Although approving the purpose of Clay's proposed concessions, Calhoun rejected them as not providing adequate safeguards. His impassioned plea was to leave slavery alone, return runaway slaves, give the South its rights as a minority, and restore the political balance. He had in view, as was later revealed, an utterly unworkable scheme of electing two presidents, one from the North and one from the South, each wielding a veto. 
Calhoun died in 1850. Before the debate was over, murmuring the sad words, The South! The South! God knows what will become of her. Appreciative fellow citizens in Charleston erected to his memory an imposing monument, which bore the inscription, Truth, Justice, and the Constitution. Calhoun had labored to preserve the Union, and had taken his stand on the Constitution, but his proposals in their behalf almost undid both. Daniel Webster next took the Senate spotlight to uphold Clay's compromise measures in his last great speech, a three-hour effort, now 68 years old and suffering from a liver complaint aggravated by high living, he had lost some of his fire in his magnificent voice. Speaking deliberately and before overflowing galleries, he urged all reasonable concessions to the South, including a new fugitive slave law with teeth. As for slavery in the territories, asked Webster, why legislate on the subject? To do so was an act of sacrilege, for Almighty God had already passed the Wilmot Proviso. The good Lord had decreed, through climate, topography, and geography, that a plantation economy, and hence a slave economy, could not profitably exist in the Mexican Session territory. Webster sanely concluded that compromise, concession, and sweet reasonableness would provide the only solutions. <laughs> If measured by its immediate effects, Webster's famed 7th of March speech, 1850, was his finest. It helped turn the tide of the North toward compromise. The clamor for printed copies became so great that Webster mailed out more than 100,000, remarking that 200,000 would not satisfy his demand. His de tremendous efforts visibly strengthened, uh, strengthened the Union sentiment. It was especially pleasing to the banking and commercial interests of the North, which stood to lose millions of dollars by secession. One prominent Washington banker canceled two notes of Webster's totaling $5,000 and sent him a personal check for 1000 and a message of congratulations. But the abolitionists, who had assumed Webster was one of them, unbraided him as a traitor, worthy of bracketing with Benedict Arnold. The poet Walt Whitman lamented, So fallen, so lost, the light withdrawn which once he wore, the glory from his gray hair is gone forevermore. Those reproaches were most unfair. Webster, who had long regarded slavery as an evil, but disunion as worse, had in fact always despised the abolitionists and never joined their ranks. Deadlock in Danger on Capitol Hill The stormy congressional debate of 1850 was not finished for the young guard. From the North, there were yet to have their say. For the young guard from the North were yet to have their say. This was the group of newer leaders who, unlike the aging old guard, had not grown up with the Union. They were more interested in pursuing and purifying it than by patching and preserving it. William H. Seward, the wiry and husky-throated freshman senator from New York, was, it, was the able spokesman for many of the younger northern radicals. A young, strong, anti-slaveryite, he came out unequivocally against concession. He seemed not to realize that compromise had brought the Union together and that when the sections could no longer compromise, they would have to part company. Seward argued earnestly that Christian legislators must obey God's moral law as well as man's mundane law. He therefore appealed, with reference to excluding slavery in the territories, to an even higher law than the Constitution. This alarming phrase, wrenched from its context, may have cost him the presidential nomination and the presidency in 1860. <clears throat> As the great debate in Congress ran its heated course, deadlock seemed certain. Blunt old President Taylor, who had allegedly fallen under the influence of men like higher law Seward, seemed bent on vetoing any compromise passed by Congress. His military ire was aroused by the threats of Texas to seize Santa Fe. He appeared to be doggedly determined to Jacksonize the dissenters, if need be, by lending an army against the, leading an army against the Texans in person and hanging all damn traitors. If troops had begun to march, the South probably would have rallied to the defense of Texas, and the Civil War might have erupted in 1850. <clears throat> Breaking the Congressional Logjam At the height of the controversy in 1850, President Taylor unknowingly helped the cause of concession by dying suddenly, probably of an acute intestinal disorder. Portly, round-faced Vice President Millard Fillmore, a colorless and conciliatory New York lawyer politician, took over the reins. As presiding officer of the Senate, he had been impressed with the arguments for conciliation, and he had gladly signed the series of compromise measures that passed Congress after seven long months of stormy debate. The balancing of interest in the Compromise of 1850 was delicate in the extreme. The struggle to get these measures accepted by the country was hardly less heated than in Congress. In the northern states, 
Union savers like Senators Clay, Webster, and Douglas orated on behalf of the Compromise. The alien Clay himself delivered more than 70 speeches as a powerful sentiment uh, for acceptance gradually crystallized in the North. It was strengthened by a growing spirit of goodwill, which sprang partly from a feeling of relief and partly from an upsurge of prosperity enriched by California gold. But the fire eaters of the South were still violently opposed to concessions. One extreme South Carolina newspaper avowed that it loathed the Union and hated the North as much as it did hell itself. A movement in the South to boycott Northern goods gained some headway, but in the end, the Southern Unionists, assisted to, by the warm glow of prosperity, prevailed. In mid-1850, an assemblage of Southern extremists had met in Nashville, Tennessee, ironically near the burial place of Andrew Jackson. <clears throat> the delegates not only took a strong position in favor of slavery, but condemned the compromise measures, then being hammered out in Congress. Meeting again later in the year, after the bills had passed, the convention broke to be a dud, proved to be a dud. By that time, Southern opinion had reluctantly accepted the verdict of Congress. Like the calm after the storm, a second era of good feelings dawned. Disquieting talk of secession subsided. Peace-loving people, both North and South, were determined that the compromises should be a finality, and that the explosive issue of slavery should be buried. But this placid period of reason proved to be all too brief. Balancing the Compromise Scales Who got the better deal on the Compromise of 1850? The answer is clearly the North. California, as a free state, tipped the Senate balance permanently against the South. The territories of New Mexico and Utah were open to slavery on the basis of popular sovereignty. But the iron law of nature, the highest law of all, had loaded the dice in favor of free soil. The Southerners urgently needed more slave territory to restore the sacred balance. If they could not carve new states out of the recent conquest of Mexico, where else might they get them? In the Caribbean was one answer. Even the apparent gains of the South rang hollow. Disgruntled Texas was to be paid $10 million towards discharging its indebtedness, but in the long run, this was a modest sum. The immense area in dispute had been torn from the side of slaveholding Texas and was almost certain to be free. The South had halted the drive towards abolition in the District of Columbia, at least temporarily, by permitting the outlawing of the slave trade in the federal district. But even this move was entering, an entering wedge toward complete emancipation in the nation's capital. Most alarmingly of all, the drastic new fugitive slave law of 1850, the Bloodhound Bill, stirred up a storm of opposition in the North. The fleeing slaves could not testify on their own behalf, and they were denied a jury trial. These harsh practices, some citizens feared, threatened to create dangerous precedents for white Americans. The federal commissioner who handled the case of a fugitive would receive $5 if the runaway was freed, and $10 if not, an arrangement that strongly resembled a bribe. Freedom-loving Northerners who aided the slaves to escape were liable to heavy fines and jail sentences. They might even be ordered to join the slave catchers, and this possibly rubbed salt into old sores. So savage was this man-stealing law that it touched off an explosive chain reaction in the North. Many shocked moderates, hitherto passive, were driven into the swelling ranks of the anti slaverites When a runaway slave from Virginia was captured in Boston in 1854, he had to be removed from the city under a heavy federal guard through the streets lined with sullen Yankees and shadowed by black draped buildings festooned with flags flying upside down. One prominent Bostonian who witnessed this grim spectacle wrote that we went to bed one night old-fashioned conservatives, compromised Union Whigs, and waked up stark mad abolitionists. The Underground Railroad stepped up its timetable and infuriated northern mobs rescued slaves from their pursuers. Massachusetts, in a move toward nullification suggestive of South Carolina in 1832, made it a penal offense for any state official to enforce the new federal statute. Other states passed personal liberty laws, which denied local jails to federal officials and otherwise hammered and hampered enforcement. The abolitionists rent the, heavy, have, rent the heavens with their protest against the man-stealing statute. A meeting presided by, over by William Lloyd Garrison in 1851 declared, we excavate it, we spit upon it, we trample it under our feet. This issue, pause for a second, this issue of states challenging uh, federal law because of moral high grounds and what they believe as constitutional and freedom grounds is, is very similar to what we see with uh, President Donald Trump and certain uh, democratic states challenging his federal laws. Beyond question, the fugitive slave law was an appalling blunder on the part of the South. No single irritant of the 1850s was more persistently galling to both sides, and none did more to awaken in the North a spirit of antagonism against the South. 
The Southerners, in turn, were embittered because the Northerners would not in good faith execute the law, the one real and immediate Southern gain from the Great Compromise. Slave catchers, with some success, redoubled their efforts. Should the shooting showdown have come in 1850? From the standpoint of the secessionists, yes. From the standpoint of the Unionists, no. Time was fighting for the North. With every passing decade, this huge section was forging further ahead in population and wealth, in crops, factories, foundries, ships, and railroads. Delay also added immensely to the moral strength of the North, to its will to, its will to fight for the Union. In 1850, countless thousands of Northern moderates were unwilling to pin the South to the rest of the nation with bayonets, but the inflammatory events of the 1850s did much to bolster the Yankee will to resist secession, whatever the cost. This one feverish decade gave the North time to accumulate the material and moral strength that provided the margin of victory. Thus, the Compromise of 1850, from one point of view, won the Civil War for the Union. Defeat and Doom for the Whigs Meeting in Baltimore, the Democratic Nomination Convention of 1852 startled the nation. Hopelessly deadlocked, it finally stampeded to the second dark horse candidate in American history, an, unround, an unrenowned lawyer-politician, Franklin Pierce, from the hills of New Hampshire. The Whigs tried to jeer him back into obscurity with the cry, Who is Franklin Pierce? Democrats replied, The young hickory of the Granite Hills. Pierce was a weak and indecisive figure, youngish, handsome, militarily erect, smiling, and convivial, he had served without real distinction in the Mexican War. As a result of a painful groin injury that caused him to fall off his horse, he was known as the Fainting General, though scandalmongers pointed to a fondness for alcohol. But he was enemyless because he had been inconspicuous, and as a pro-Southern Northerner, he was acceptable to the slavery wing of the Democratic Party. His platform came out emphatically for the finality of the Compromise of 1850, fugitive slave law and all. The Whigs, also convening in Baltimore, missed a splendid opportunity to capitalize on their record in statescraft. Able to boast a praiseworthy achievement in the Compromise of 1850, they might logically have nominated President Fillmore or Senator Webster, both of whom were associated with it, but having won in the, in the past with only military heroes, they turned to another old fuss and feathers, Winfield Scott, perhaps the ablest American general of his generation. Although he was a huge and impressive figure, his manner bordered on haughtiness. His personality not only repelled the masses, but eclipsed his genuinely statesmanlike achievements. The Whig platform praised the Compromise of 1850 as a lasting arrangement, though less enthusiastically than the, than the Democrats. With slavery and secessionism to some extent soft-pedaled, the campaign again degenerated into a dull and childish attack on personalities. Democrats ridiculed Scott's pompacity, Whigs charged that Pierce was the hero of many a well-fought bottle. Democrats cried exultantly, We poked him in 44, we'll pierce him in 52. Luckily for the Democrats, the Whig party was hopelessly split. Anti-slavery Whigs of the North swallowed Scott as their nominee, but deplored his platform, which endorsed the hated fugitive slave law. The current phrase ran, We accept the candidate, but spit on the platform. Southern Whigs, who doubted Scott's loyalty to the Compromise of 1850 and especially the Fugitive Slave Law, accepted the platform but spat on the candidate. More than 5,000 Georgia Whigs, finality men, men, voted in vain for Webster, although he had died nearly two weeks before the election. General, General Scott, victorious on the battlefield, met defeat at the ballot box. His friends remarked whimsically that he was not used to running. Actually, he was stabbed in the back by his fellow Whigs, notably in the South. The pliant Pierce won in a landslide, 254 electoral votes to 42, although the popular count was closer, 1,601,117 to 1,385,453. The election of 1852 was fraught with frightening significance, though it may have seemed tame at the time. It marked the effective end of the disorganized Whig Party, and within a few years, a complete death. The Whigs' demise augured the eclipse of national parties and the worrisome rise of purely sectional political ailment, alignments. The Whigs were governed at times by the crassest opportunism, and they won only two presidential elections, 1840 and 1848. In their colorful career, both the war heroes, but with but both with war heroes, they finally choked to death trying to swallow the distasteful fugitive slave law. But the greatest contribution, and a noteworthy one indeed, was to help uphold the ideal of the Union through their electoral strength in the South and 
through the eloquent of eloquence of leaders like Henry Clay and Daniel Webster. Both of these statesmen, by unhappy coincidence, died during the 1852 campaign, but the good they had done lived after them and contributed powerfully to the eventual preservation of the United, United States. President Pierce the Expansionist At the outset, the Pierce administration displayed vigor. The new president, standing confidently before some 15,000 people on Inauguration Day, delivered the, from memory, a clear-voiced <clears throat> inaugural address. His cabinet contained aggressive Southerners, including a, sec a Secretary of War, one Jefferson Davis, future president of the Confederacy. The people of Dixie were determined to acquire more slave territory, and the compliant Pierce was prepared to be their willing tool. The intoxicating victories of the Mexican War stimulated the spirit of manifest destiny. The conquest of a Pacific frontage and the discovery of gold on it aroused lively interest in the trans land routes of Central America, chiefly in Panama and Nicaragua. Many Americans were looking even further ahead to potential canal routes and to the islands flanking them, notably Spain's Cuba. These visions especially fired the ambitions of the slavocrats. They lusted for new territory after the Compromise of 1850 seemingly closed most of the lands of the Mexican Cession to the peculiar institution of slavery. In 1856, a Texan proposed a toast that was drunk with gusto to the Southern Republic bounded on the north by the Mason-Dixon line and on the south by the Isthmus of Tehautahupac, southern Mexico, including Cuba and all the other lands on our southern shore. Southerners took a special interest in Nicaragua. A brazen American adventurer, William Walker, tried repeatedly to grab control of the Central American country in the 1850s. He had earlier attempted and failed to seize Baja California from Mexico and turn it into a slave state. Backed by an armed force recruited largely in the South, he installed himself as president in 1856 and promptly legalized slavery. One Southern newspaper proclaimed to the planter aristocracy that Walker, the gray-eyed man of destiny, now offers Nicaragua to you and your slaves at a time when you cannot have a friend on the face on the earth. But a coalition of Central American nations formed an alliance to overthrow him. President Pierce withdrew diplomatic recognition, and the gray-eyed gray man's destiny was to crumple before a Honduran firing squad in 1860. Nicaragua was also of vital concern to, the great, to great Britain, the world's leading maritime and commercial power. Fearing that the grasping Yankees would monopolize the trade arteries there, the British made haste to secure a solid foothold at Greytown to the eastern end of the proposed Nicaraguan canal route. This challenge to the Monroe Doctrine forthwith raised the ugly possibility of an armed clash. The crisis was surmounted in 1850 by the clayton bulwa Treaty, which stipulated that neither American nor Britain would fortify or secure exclusive control over any future Ismithian waterway. This agreement at the time seemed necessary to halt the British, but to American canal promoters in later years it proved to be a ball and chain. America had become a Pacific power with the acquisition of California and Oregon, both of which faced Asia. The prospects of a rich trade with the Far East now seem rosier. Americans had already established contacts with China, and shippers were urging Washington to push for a commercial intercourse with Japan. The Mikado's empire, after some disagreeable experiences with the European world, had withdrawn into a cocoon of isolationism and had remained there for over 200 years. The Japanese were so protective of their insularity that they had prohibited shipwreck, shipwrecked foreigners uh, from leaving and refused to readmit to Japan their own sailors who had been washed up on the west coast of North America. But by 1853, as events proved, Japan was ready to emerge from reclusion, partly because of the Russian menace. The Washington government was now eager to pry them open, open the bamboo gates of Japan. It dispatched a fleet of awesome smoke-belching warships commanded by Commodore Matthew C. Perry, brother of the hero of the Battle of Lake Erie, in 1813. By a judicious display of force and tact, he persuaded the Japanese in 1854 to sign a memorable treaty. It provided for only a commercial foot in the door, but it was the beginning of an epical relationship between the land of the rising sun and the Western world. Ironically, this achievement attracted little notice at the time, partly because Perry devised no memorable slogan. <laughs> Coveted Cuba, Pearl of the Antilles Sugar-rich Cuba, lying, lying off the nation's southern doorstep, was the prime objective of Manifest Destiny in the 1850s. Supporting a large population of enslaved blacks, it was coveted by the South as the most desirable slave territory available. Carved into several states, it would once more restore the political balance in the Senate. 
Cuba was a kind of heirloom, the most important remnant of Spain's once mighty New World Empire. Polk, the expansionist, had taken steps to offer $100 million for it, but the sensitive Spaniards had, re- had replied that they would rather see it sunk into the ocean before they would sell it to the Americans at any price. With the purchase completely out of the question, Caesar was apparently the only way to pluck the ripening few- fruit. Private adventurers from the South now undertook to shake the tree, tree of manifest destiny. During 1850-51, two filibustering expeditions from the Spanish filibustero, meaning freebooter or pirate, each numbering several hundred armed men, descended upon Cuba. Both feeble efforts were repelled, and the last one ended in tragedy when the leader and 50 followers, some of them from the best families of the South, were summarily shot or strangled. So outraged were the Southerners that an angry mob sacked Spain's consulate in New Orleans. Spanish officials in Cuba rashly forced a slow sh- showdown in 1854 when they seized an American steamer, Black Warrior, on a technicality. Now it was the time for President Pierce, dominated as he was by the South, to provoke a war with Spain and seize Cuba. The major powers of Europe, England, France, and Russia, were about to become bogged down in the Crimean War and hence were unable to aid Spain. An incredible cloak-and-dagger episode followed. The Secretary of State instructed the American ministers in Spain, England, and France to prepare confidential recommendations for the acquisition of Cuba. Meeting initially at Osted, Belgium, the three envoys drew up a top-secret dispatch, soon known as the Osted Manifesto. This startling document urged that the administration offer $120 million for Cuba. If Spain refused, and if its continued ownership endangered American interests, the United States would be justified in wresting the island from the Spaniards. The secret Osted Manifesto quickly leaked out. Northern free soilers, already angered by the fugitive slave law and other gains for slavery, rose in an outburst of wrath against the Manifesto of Brigands. Confronted but with disruption at home, the red-faced Pierce administration was forced to drop its brazen schemes for Cuba. Clearly, the slavery issue, like a two-headed snake with heads at each other's throats, deadlocked territorial expansion in the 1850s. The North, flush with manifest destiny, was developing a renewed appetite for Canada. The South coveted Cuba. Neither section would permit the other to get the apple of its eye, so neither got either. The shackled black hands of Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's cabin, uh, Uncle Tom, sorry, whose plight had already stung the conscience of the North, now held the South back from Cuba. The internal distresses of the United States were such that, for once, it could not take advantage of Europe's distresses, in this case the Crimean War. Pacific Railroad Promoters and the Gadsden Purchase Acute transportation problems were another legacy of the Mexican War. The newly acquired prizes of California and Oregon might just as well have been islands some 8,000 miles west of the nation's capital. The sea routes to and from the Isthmus of Panama, to say nothing of those around South America, were too long. Covered wagon travel <clears throat> past bleaching animal bones was possible, but slow and dangerous. A popular song of, recalled... They swam the wide rivers and crossed the tall peaks and camped on the prairie for weeks upon weeks. Starvation and cholera and hard work and slaughter, they reached California, spite of hell and high water. Feasible land transportation was imperative, or the newly won possessions of the Pacific coast might break away. Camels were even proposed as the answer. Several score of these temperamental beasts, ships of the desert, were imported from the Near East, but mule-driving Americans did not adjust to them. A transcontinental railroad was clearly the only real solution to the problem. Railroad promoters, both north and south, had projected many drawing board routes to the Pacific coast, but the estimated cost in all cases was so great that for many years there could obviously be only one line. Should a terminus be in the north or the south? The favorite section would reap rich rewards in wealth, population, and influence. The South, losing the economic race with the North, was eager to extend a railroad through the adjacent southern, southwestern territory all the way to California. Another chunk of Mexico now seemed desirable, because the campaigns of the recent war had shown that the best railway route ran slightly south of the Mexican border. Secretary of War Jefferson Davis, a Mississippian, arranged to have James Gadsden, a prominent South Carolina railroad man, appointed minister to Mexico. Finding Santa Ana in power for the sixth and last time, and as usual, in need of money, Gadsden made a gratifying headway. Gratifying headway. 
he negotiated a treaty in 1853 which ceded to the United States the Gadsden Purchase Area for $10 million. The transaction aroused much criticism among, among Northerners, who objected to paying a huge sum for a cactus-strewn desert nearly the size of Gadsden, South Carolina. Undeterred, the Senate approved the pact, and in the process, short-sightedly eliminated a window on the Sea of Cortez. No doubt, the Gadsden Purchase enabled the South to claim the coveted railroad with even greater insistence. A southern track would be easier to build because the mountains were less high, and because the route, unlike the proposed northern lines, would not pass through any unorganized territory. Texas was already a state at this point, and New Mexico, with the Gadsden Purchase added, was a formally recognized organized territory, with federal troops available to provide protection against marauding tribes of Indians. Any northern or central railroad line would have to be thrust through the unorganized territories of Nebraska, where the buffalo and the Indians roamed. Northern railroad boosters quickly replied that if organized territory were the test, then Nebraska should be organized. Such a move was not premature because thousands of land-hungry pioneers were already poised on the Nebraska border, but all schemes proposed in Congress for organizing the territory were greeted with apathy or hostility by many Southerners. Why should the South help create new free soil states and thus cut its own throat by facilitating a northern railroad? Douglas's Kansas-Nebraska Scheme At this point, in 1854, Senator Stephen A. Douglas of Illinois delivered a counterstroke to offset the Gadsden thrust for southern expansion westward. A squat, bull-necked, and heavy-chested figure, the Little Giant, radiated the energy and breezy optimism of the self-made man. An ardent booster for the West, he longed to break the north-south deadlock over western expansion and stretch a line of settlements across the continent. He had also invested heavily in Chicago real estate and in railway stock, and was eager to have the Windy City become the eastern terminus of the proposed Pacific Railroad. He would thus endear himself to the voters of Illinois, benefit his section, and enrich his own purse. A veritable steam engine in bridges, Douglas threw himself behind a legislative scheme that would enlist the support of a reluctant South. The proposed territory of Nebraska would be sliced into two territories, Kansas and Nebraska. Their status regarding slavery would be settled by popular sovereignty, a democratic concept to which Douglas and his Western constituents were deeply attached. Kansas, which lay due west of slaveholding Missouri, would presumably choose to be a slave state. But Nebraska, lying west of free soil Iowa, would presumably become a free state. Stephen Douglas's Kansas-Nebraska scheme ran headlong into a formidable political debate. The Missouri Compromise of 1820 had forbidden slavery in the proposed Nebraska Territory, which lay north of the sacred 3630 line, and the only way to open the region to popular sovereignty was to repeal the ancient compact outright. This bold step Douglas was prepared to take, even at the risk of shattering the uneasy truce patched together by the Compromise of 1850. Many Southerners who had not conceived of Kansas as slave soil rose to the bait. Here was a chance to gain one more slave state. The pliable President Pierce, under the thumb of Southern advisors, threw his full weight behind the Kansas-Nebraska bill. But the Missouri Compromise, now 34 years old, cannot be brushed aside lightly. Whatever Congress passes, it can repeal, but this time the North had come to regard the sectional pact as almost as sacred as the Constitution itself. Free Soil members of Congress struck back with a vengeance. They met their match in the violently gesticulating Douglas, who was the ablest rough-and-tumble debater of his generation. Employing twisted logic and oratorical fireworks, he rammed the bill through Congress, with strong support from many Southerners. So heated were the political passions that bloodshed was barely averted. Some members carried a concealed revolver or a boring knife, or both. Douglas's motives in prodding anew the snarling dog of slavery have long puzzled historians. His personal interests have already been mentioned. In addition, his foes accused him of angling for the presidency in 1856. Yet his admirers have argued plausibly in his defense that if he had not championed the ill-omened bill, someone else would have. The truth seems to be that Douglas acted somewhat impulsively and recklessly. His heart did not bleed over the issue of slavery, and he declared repeatedly that he did not care whether it was voted up or down in the territories. What he failed to perceive was that hundreds of thousands of his fellow citizens in the North did deeply feel, uh, feel deeply on this moral issue. They regarded the repeal of the Missouri Compromise as an intolerable breach of faith, and they would henceforth resist to the last trench all future Southern demands for slave territory. 
As Abraham Lincoln said, the North wanted to give the, to the pioneers in the West a clean bed with no snakes in it. Genuine leaders, like skillful chess players, must foresee the possible effects of their move. Douglas predicted a hell of a storm, but he grossly underestimated its proportions. His critics in the North, branding him a Judas or a traitor, greeted his name with frenzied boos, hisses, and three groans for Doug. But he still enjoyed a high degree of popularity among his following in the Democratic Party, especially in Illinois, a stronghold of popular sovereignty. Congress legislates a civil war. <clears throat> the Kansas-Nebraska Act, a curtain raiser to the terrible drama, was one of the most momentous measures ever to pass Congress. By one way of reckoning, it greased the slippery slope to civil war. Anti-slavery Northerners were angered by what they condemned as an act of bad faith by the Nebraskals and their Nebraskality. All future compromise with the South would be immeasurably more difficult, and without compromise, there was bound to be conflict. Henceforth, the Fugitive Slave Law of 1850, previously enforced in the North only half-heartedly, was a dead letter. The Kansas-Nebraska Act wrecked two compromises, that of 1820, which it repealed specifically, and that of 1850, which Northern opinion repealed indirectly. Emerson wrote, The Fugitive Slave Law did much to unglue the eyes of men, and now the Nebraska Bill leaves us staring. Northern abolitionists and Southern fire-eaters alike saw less and less that they could live with. The growing legion of anti-slavery rights gained numerous recruits who resented the grasping move by the slaveocracy for Kansas. The Southerners, in turn, became inflamed when the Free Soilers tried to control Kansas, contrary to the presumed deal. The proud Democrats, a party now over half a century old, were shattered by the Kansas-Nebraska Act. They did elect a president in 1856, but he was the last one they were to boost into the White House for 28 long years. Undoubtedly, the most durable offspring of the Kansas-Nebraska blunder was the new Republican Party. It sprang up spontaneously in the Midwest, notably in Wisconsin and Michigan, as a mighty moral protest against the gains of slavery. Gathering together disaffected elements, it soon included disgruntled Whigs, among them Abraham Lincoln, Democrats, Free Soilers, Know-Nothings, and other foes of the Kansas-Nebraska Act. The Hod Podge Party spread eastward with the swiftness of a prairie fire and with the zeal of a religious crusade. Unheard of and unheralded at the beginning of 1854, it elected a Republican Speaker of the House of Representatives within two years. Never really a third-party movement, it erupted with such a force as to become almost overnight the second major political party, and a purely sectional one at that. At long last, the dreaded sectional rift had appeared. The new Republican Party would not be allowed south of the Mason-Dixon line. Countless Southerners subscribed wholeheartedly to the sentiment that it was the, quote, a nigger-stealing, stinking, putrid abolition party. The Union was in dire peril.